tonight is that we're gonna we're gonna study together, uh, and after we study, we'll daven maris, the evening service for Shavuot, which includes um, a little piece of Havdalah as we move from Shabbat into the Hag, and then there will be further study opportunities. So, Deborah, you're still gonna hold. Here for, wants to stay with us. Right. For anyone who wants to stay, there will be learning that happens in person here. Um, for those who are joining us in Zoom, you will also be able to continue to stay on and learn with those folks here. And then there is also the YouTube link that is part of our conservative movement, USCJ's ongoing learning, which I think they have scheduled all the way at least until 1215, if not. Um, further on into the evening, which you can grab from home. So those are, that, those are all the options. All right. So um, the tonight's uh, lesson that I that I want to share with everyone, the text that I want to share, I titled "Sticks and Stones May Break My Bones, But Words Can Never Hurt Me." With, of course, a question mark. Um, welcome, welcome. We're so glad you're here. Here's the text. Great to see you, Ibaris. Welcome. Um, feel free to grab some dessert. Don't be shy. So, of we course, like <laughs> it is a very Jewish thing that words matter. Words create worlds. Words uh, can hurt. Words can can build extraordinary things. And so, we're going to look. Um, very specifically at words. And we do this often at, during the Dora Torah on Shabbat in the sanctuary, where we really take a close look at just a couple of words and see what is buried beneath. So that's what we're going to look at tonight. And the text from for tonight, the main text that we're going to be building on is from Leviticus. It was actually just a couple parshiot ago, maybe two weeks. And so this is Leviticus, let's face it. Uh, it's a very legalistic text and it doesn't have many narrative portions. You might consider it one of the more boring um, books of the Bible, but hopefully we will um, bring it to life with this very relevant ethical um, text. After all, we all use words um, and my hope and prayer is that we emerge from our learning tonight just ever more happy, ever more aware and sensitized to the words that we use. All right. So would somebody be willing to read this verse, the first verse on the page from Leviticus 25, 14? Fine. Great. When you buy or sell merchandise from your fellow, a person shall not exploit his brother. Fantastic. Okay. So already um, there have been laws that have been set out in the book of Leviticus referring to the idea of having um, proper weights and measures. You might remember that from Leviticus 19. It's a very famous section. It's part of that portion that we call like the holiness code, um, which includes, of course, love your neighbors yourself. There's already a lot of material referring to the idea of doing honest business. So when this comes up a couple chapters later, the rabbis reason that this particular kind of um, financial exploitation probably has to do with something a little bit different. And the rabbis um, consider this to, to sort of be the, um, the softer crime of taking advantage of a potential business partner's lack of knowledge. So think about this in your own life. I know there have been many experiences uh, since we moved to Raleigh where I was doing something the first for the first time, like buying a house or buying a car for the first time. And anybody who's done that for the first time, we're extremely vulnerable, right? There's so much to know about that particular kind of transaction. Uh, it would be very easy to take advantage of somebody else in, in that sort of situation. All right, so we're looking at this language. I translated it here, um, and I, I didn't make this up. This is one of the, the translations. <laughs> Al tonu, which means not to exploit, but that's what we're really gonna focus on. What is this thing that says don't exploit? What, what's, um, what's the full kind 
expectation with the full meeting that we can extrapolate it. Okay, so that's part number one. Any questions so far? Yes, Mike. Uh, I'm looking at the word fellow, hmm. and I'm looking at the Hebrew for fellow. Um, I'm wondering whether this means you have to treat you know, people in your own, you know, what, what's the range of that? Can you, whom can you treat badly? <laughs> or, or can you treat, <laughs> I mean, is it, in other words, is it, saying, is it saying that there is a certain group of people you have to treat properly? Yeah, that's a great <laughs> question. And I'm sure it does in the text. I don't know it offhand, but for example, when we learn um, you should love your neighbor as, your, as yourself, there are many different understandings of what is your re'ah, what is your neighbor, and <laughs> what fits in, what are the confines of, uh, of that. Let's assume for the purposes tonight that we should, we should apply this broadly, um, <laughs> that we should extend this to the furthest reaches, but it's a good question. Yes, Larry. I think when goes from fellow and then says brother, mm -hmm. I think it means treat a fellow like he was your brother, so that you do to do. Beautiful, beautiful, absolutely. So we we could look at this, um, are you saying like, your the, the first is sort of a more general, and it's saying, don't let this person be sort of anonymous to you. You should treat him as if he was your brother. That we're ultimately, we're all family. I love that, beautiful, great. Anyone else have that? Yes, Jonathan. I'm also thinking of, um, uh, I, I know that anything that's uh, in Torah has, that is repeated, there one school thought that, that that's the Torah placing uh, extra importance on something. There is no like, there is no duplication in Torah. There's only extra emphasis. Yes. And I don't know, I, I think that there is um, enough like, um, There's enough like uh, and, like memory in this text of mm -hmm. like of earlier patriarchal matriarchal narratives when um, business dealings were uh, you know more fraught with uh, with complications that I don't know I, I see the I see the expo I see like I can think of examples like exploitation in my mind I don't think it I'll be curious to what people. Think of when I think of that word, but I can think of plenty of examples earlier on where maybe maybe in this in this section we are reminded that we, we lived in perhaps before Torah and more mm -hmm. at a time where exploitation was more common between brother and brother. Mm -hmm. Great point. And I want to build on what you said specifically that there is no this assumption that there's no um, duplication in words, that when words are repeated, they mean something else. That is a core rabbinic concept. So just a couple verses after this first verse um, that Bonnie read, verse 14, um, we see it repeated again. So Bonnie, will you now read this following verse? Do not exploit one another, but fear your God, for I, the Lord, am your God. Great. Okay. So now when it gets repeated again, the rabbis um, of the Talmud decide that this must refer to more than just financial exploitation. This, uh, this first verse that Bonnie read, okay, that's got to be dealing with um, this kind of specific softer crime, you might say, of exploiting a potential business pers person, partner, or customer's lack of knowledge. But now it's using that same language below Tonu and it's more general. So when the rabbis ask what does this repetition add, they reason that this prohibition now extends beyond strictly financial transactions and it has to do with all realms of transaction, of not being exploited. And they're going to give us some examples of what fit into this category of what they're going to call exploitation. And so we're going to look at these examples that show up in a Talmudic passage that help us to see that, first of all, the exploitation is beyond the financial realm. 
and it is of a specific nature. And so we're going to kind of be deductive and we're going to look at these six examples and try to read them together. What what kind of brings them together? What connects them and how might they also connect back to this idea of this financial exploitation that we're also, of course, trying to avoid. All right, everybody on the same page? Yeah. I was Great. just thinking about what you're saying. And I was reading yesterday, the day before, something like that, about the um, should not put a stumbling block in front of a blind man and how that was interpreted as far as don't have don't do insider trading because someone is blind to the knowledge you have it's, it's the same thing Absolutely. and i'm wondering how that contrasts with here because i immediately thought maybe that's more of um more malice more that but still this exploit has the connotation of I am getting something for it. I am bettering myself mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, versus other sorts of abuse, mm -hmm. which could fit in here. Yes, I like how you both made the connection that we're going to look at this in a sort of expansive symbolic way. It's not just about literally, you know, putting a stumbling block. There's all kinds of ways we can extrapolate that out. And there is something specific here about exploitation and sort of personal gain. That's a little bit different. So great point, Stephanie. Yeah. Um, fellow person, are we having a technical? I'm just trying to do my Great. Is that better? Okay. I think so. Okay. Um, it does mean people, but it could mean um. Fellow person. <laughs> yeah. It's just another, but there are actually a lot of words for fellow, um, which all have slightly different connotations, but I can't really speak in a scholarly way to why that one is different. I don't know, maybe the Ambari who have the Hebrew background could say why that, what the connotation is of um, Amitekha. No. Okay, great. That makes me feel better. There. <laughs> um, I think that the important point here is they bring the fear to God. So before, it's like, don't do it to another person. But here, it basically says you are sinning against God, that it's a sin rather than just that. Absolutely. Fantastic. And we see this also just um, drawing our memory back to Leviticus 19. We saw this with a bunch of mitzvot that come out in that. Um, section as well, where it'll say, you know, do not, uh, are we better with the camera? Okay, do not hold a grudge, you know, I am the Lord your God. And it's it's a, both a reminder that you're not just sinning against the other person, there is a, a divine um, impact consequence. And I think there is an assumption, and we'll get into this a little bit more, that it is possible that you might think you could get away with this. You might think that you, you could do this form of harm and it would go unnoticed. And this line at the end that comes to say, I am the Lord your God is there to remind you, it will be, the impact will be known, felt, experienced in some other kind of energetic divine realm. PJ. And a perfect example of this is a shift. Um, where you make a match and there's something about the bride or groom mm -hmm. that the other family wasn't made aware of, mm -hmm. you know, someone uh, suffers anxiety or depression or has some kind of personal hygiene issue or, mm -hmm. you know, or whatever it is. The rabbis um, were very practical. Yes. Yeah, but yes. that, I mean, but it's happened that yes. the marriage and the sure. other family comes and says, well, you didn't, you didn't tell it's us, close. you didn't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. This can happen with people in relationships. Eric, did you have a comment? No. Uh, Bonnie. I have a, a question just before we move sure. forward as we're clearly about to dive deep into the word yes. exploit. Yes. <laughs> just I'm like on the sciencey side. So just to help from all the English academics in the room of definitions, because I only know this word as to take advantage of. Yeah. I mean, that's... is there any other? <clears throat> 
Make sense. Want to jump in? Um, there's a dictionary in the home. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody wants. It would make more sense to look up the definition in Hebrew. Yeah, yeah, yeah. in Hebrew. Uh, I'm we not sure that the exploit is the, the right, right word. Yes. word. There are it's, a variety of It's words. more deceive. Leonot, yes. Leonot in Hebrew means like, you know, deceive someone. When you have the knowledge and you hide it from somebody, you're taking advantage, you're taking of, advantage of, it. of it, but you are deceiving. Them. Great. That's, so maybe that's, a, that's a beautiful, in, a beautiful Indeed. nuance. Yes, I'm that's so glad amazing. you, um, I'm glad, glad you added that. <laughs> All right. Who would like to read um, from the Talmud? It's all in English. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, Nina, will you read in the back? Or? All right. I'll lift this. Uh, yeah, we'll take it really slowly. So just the first section, and then we'll go one at a time. A person shall not exploit their fellow. The Torah is speaking about exploitative speech. How do we turn it up? Okay, pause. So, the, this section of the Talmud quotes this verse from the Torah that we're focusing on and says that in this follow up verse, the second one that, that Bonnie read, um, it's specifically talking about exploitative or deceptive, I like that, speech. How so? All right. Keep going, Nina. First one. If one is a penitent, another should not say to them, remember your prior deeds. Okay, pop. Great. So what is this first one saying? Just a simple understanding. Um, somebody who's saying they're sorry or who's um, repenting. Great. So if somebody is repentant or repenting and is doing the work of tshuva, thank you, Ellen, and it's acknowledged that they have made some kind of error, some kind of mistake, you should not say to them, remember your prior deeds. Just did this to one of my children today. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry. It's so tempting, right? I mean, think about anybody in your life or just think about a time when you've been harmed by something. Maybe somebody, you know, these things tend to come up most um, in your your close circle. You know, somebody hurts you, you find a way to make things right with each other. And because we're humans, it happens again. And when it happens again, you feel the sting of that moment, but you also may feel the sting of past mo a past moment or past moments. And it's so tempting to then lash out and be like, you're still doing it, you know, and to lay into them for not only this infraction, but past infractions. Yes, John. I'm thinking about how um, we know that um, through the arc of the high holy days, um, we know that we are different like from the uh, from the beginning of the High Holy Day season to the end of the High Holy Day. We season. would help. Yes. Uh, we well, got our homework. Yes. Uh, yes. That's the end. And there's this idea that you know at the end, some, your soul is you know just reborn in some in some way and through and God the God self has accepted in some way that penitence. In some ways, it seems like there's something like uh, if I, if I, if if God is, has 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 you know accepted my penitence, like who are you not to accept mm. that penitence? Nice, yeah, beautiful, love that, Deborah. Yeah, but I think there's a difference um, when, when you said you know, but you're doing it again, or you're still doing it. That's not a penitence. Right. I mean, I think that what Jonathan is talking about is if you go through, truly go through the process of Shua, you don't do it anymore. So I think what they're saying is, or at least, well, I mean, that's part of Shua, right? That you find yourself, well, I'm not saying that you do, but, but in that, I mean, that's part of it, that you find yourself in the same situation again, and you don't repeat the behavior. So. In its idealized form. Right, right. So, so when they're, um, when it says that you don't remind a penitent of what they've done, I think it's saying you don't remind someone who has truly done the work of changing their behavior the way they used to behave. 
not necessarily to say to somebody, you know, as, as all parents and teachers have done, you know, you say you're sorry, but then you go out and you do it again. That's a different behavior, it seems to me, than being a penitent. And I think that's not what they're talking about, Ms. Bruce. It's an excellent point. But I can say that I have committed that sin even when I know well, I think we all have. But <laughs> really has done the work of Juba, but then they do it again, um, even despite their best intentions. I think it's a very human thing. Yeah, very human. All of these examples are kind of weird in that if you were applying them to the buying and selling merchandise example, the first first, how would you say, um, remember your prior deeds? for an advantage in, or in deception when you're buying or selling. It's emotional manipulation, not just right. not just something good. Not something mm -hmm. else. Good. Great. Great. Right. 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 Hold that. Yes. Amy. Well I was just gonna comment to that because to me the re remember your prior deeds and especially with buying and selling. Um, you come to me and uh, and 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 you're bargaining or whatever and I say yeah but remember you were a thief once, mm -hmm. right? Or you know, like you don't you don't bring that up and throw it in their face of something that is in the past that you haven't let go. They've let go of it. They've moved on, and you don't remind them. You don't embarrass them, but you also don't take advantage of that because I know you were once a thief. I know that I can hold that over you, and I can sell you for less mm -hmm. or something. Mm -hmm. Right. So that's to me that's exploiting mm -hmm. someone based on their prior deeds. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Ellen. Well, to me this kind of reminds me. My body has done this a little bit further. You know, we suggested that in order to avoid this exact situation, a penitent should change their name mm -hmm. or even move to a totally different place where they're not alone. Yes, so that this will yes. not be, no, because of the seven steps yes. that my mother said, yes. oh, yes. should Bob. I think the last one is move somewhere else. Yes, that's an option. Um, <laughs> but he, he also says that yeah, what you've done to Shiva, it's You're done. over, it's done, and it's nobody complete. should ever bring it up. Yeah. And that that is the main point. Yeah, Erin. Um, my sister, she's in a relationship with a guy, and um, we we're still not warmed up to him. <laughs> He's been very emotionally abused mm -hmm. by my sister. Mm -hmm. And one of the things about emotional abusers is they're very, especially in a romantic relationship, they're very um, distrustful. distrustful trustful of you. Mm -hmm. My sister went and cheated on him uh, as revenge mm -hmm. for something. Mm -hmm. And we knew that it was going to be a bad idea because he was going to hold it over her head forever. Mm -hmm. And it's something that we obviously don't approve of her for doing that. But we also know that she will be way worse when it comes mm -hmm. to the reaction mm -hmm. and how he's going to hang it over her, even if she that's a painful, painful example and an extreme example, but it, it absolutely makes sense. Thank you for sharing that, Erin. All right, Eva, let's take a look at the second one. Again, we're just kind of holding in the back of our minds what might connect these uh, specific exploitative examples of exploitative speech. All right, go for it. If one is a child of Congress, another should not say to them, remember the deeds of your ancestors. All right. So if you uh, have become a Jew through a conversion process, namely that your parents were not, either your parents converted um, or that you yourself are a convert, and many of many people in this room already know that it is a halakha, it is a Jewish law, we never sort of... Um, especially in a negative sense, kind of remind a person like, oh, well, you know, you're a convert or you came from different people or, you know, anything in that, that whole category. Um, so that's basically kind of what's being hinted at. Any thoughts or comments about this specific thing? Oh, yes, great, Susan. It, it says to me that um, you, don't, you don't judge someone as being less than because their starting point might have been different than what yours was. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes, yeah. Larry. I think these both of these things are offensive comments. It reminds me of Lush on the Rock. Yes, they absolutely fit into Lush on the Rock. They are really offensive. And I think it's really important that we're give, getting the very specific examples here. What is so offensive? Yes, Pilar. In my mind is microaggression. 
Oh, it's a microaggression. A micro it is a microaggression. That's true. Yeah. I, the rabbit didn't have a word for microaggression, but yes, <laughs> macro. Yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And again, and that connects it to the first statement. It's a reminder of like where you come from on some level. It's, it's a different different path, but yeah, yes. Yeah. yeah, my thought was you know, you know the word convert, but I think just on a on a global level, and the thing that came to me was the Holocaust. And you know, people who don't like German people because of what happened in the Holocaust, and that was you know that was not the person that did anything. That was their ancestor. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. on a on a on a global level, I think we see that as far as we're not responsible for the deaths of our people who come before. All right, great, Steve. So there are. Multiple doors into being Jewish. Um, and there's a social door, and there's a by birth door, and there's a religious door. And they sometimes conflict with each other. Um, and yeah, we have the whole who is a Jew argument from various things. But I find that I'm, I'm okay with that. I came in through a religious door, and uh, and I'm I'm happy with where I am. You know, I struggle a little when the the milieu or the discussion or the topic is Jewish peoplehood, nationhood, belonging. Mm -hmm. I feel like I have to struggle to justify myself a little more there. Mm -hmm. Even when talking with Jews who are not or religious at all, yeah. say yeah. you know, and yeah. you might have people argue against them on, on that mm -hmm. uh, front. Um, it's very but, but yeah, there's, there are there are different valences of this. Mm -hmm. Ellen, um, to me there's there's an extension to this one, which is very common now, especially with all the, the push for diversity, where somebody whose skin color is different. Their eye shape is different. They walk into a synagogue and immediately there's a bunch of other people who are Ashkenazi. Mm -hmm. It's really a Sephardi. Mm -hmm. It happens to be Sephardi in Mishraki too. Mm -hmm. Where did you come from? Where did you mm -hmm. grow up? You know, why are you here because you do not look Jewish? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which is also my little question. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. And it's something that I think all of us regardless mm -hmm. where we come from, we need to be aware that Jews are all kinds of people. Yeah. We come in all kinds of shapes, colors, yeah. whatevers. And if somebody says they're Jewish, end of story. Yeah. We have to take them at their word. We don't argue with them. We don't question. Yeah. So if they walk into a synagogue, you belong. You belong. Yeah. Right. And that's something I know that being you know, the ushers, we try to do. Yeah. Absolutely. Beth Ann. So I'm kind of in both of these examples that that, that Palmer has given, and kind of going back to the verse, you know, do not exploit one another, but fear your God. It's almost like it's saying, see, you don't exploit these people. See the Philem Elohim in each of these people because that's in everyone. Yeah, beautiful. Yes. It's so the first part is don't exploit them, but the why, the reasoning, right. the basis yeah. for that is remember, like. Everyone is created in the image of God. Absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah. I think also um, it kind of just all goes under the um, on the on the on the on the because like it's saying like don't exploit um, anyone, but like the word there just means like your people, and so the thing like um, like. They're like they're all your fellow or people or whatever word you want to use, mm -hmm. but like that. I think it's just like all kind of falls into that sort of So one of the this part of what connects these um, pieces together is this idea that these are you're talking about your people. These are your people, and your people, meaning all of us, have to speak to each other in a particular way. Mm -hmm. All right, let's go to number three now. 
If one is a convert themselves and is coming to study Torah, another should not say to them, the mouth that ate non-kosher food is now coming to study Torah, which was spoken from the mouth of the Almighty. <laughs> Isn't that so rude? Oh my God, yes, exactly. Yes. It must be helpful for this talk. I'm, I'm stuck on the non-kosher food. Um, <laughs> I, just, I just want to know. Yes. What I know of, of the passages um, in Torah that describe uh, or that serve as the basis of the of the kashrut, of the code of kashrut, it, it, it never struck me as like judging what was not kosher. It rather was like God declaring, you know, establishing that kind of division and and, and establishing the, the expectation. expectation that you shall choose, exercise that choice and, and follow that. Is there a judgment in this case? Yeah, I mean, this is just an it? insult. It's just a, it's a, it's an extreme insult to say like, oh, look, but you can imagine this. I mean, even now, right? Because all of us are inconsistent in our practice. I think it's fair to say that. Probably few among us, well, okay. My, I am, I could not stand in front of you and say that my practice is pious across the board. I have things that I am particularly meticulous about in my spiritual life. I have things that I am less meticulous about in my spiritual life. And I just have all the mistakes that I make on a regular basis. But, um, I, you know, this would just be, there are people who, let's say, okay, they go out and they'll eat a hamburger, but they're going to come to Torah study, they'll eat a hamburger at McDonald's, I'm making this up, not that that's the worst thing in the world, and, but they come to Shul to study Torah on a regular basis. So far, be it from, from hamburgers, me. cheeseburger. Oh, the cheeseburger, there we go. <laughs> let's let's up the ante a little bit. Okay. So, I mean, that would be horrible. Even to forget about it if I even said it, but even to think like, who are you, that cheeseburger eating person, to then come and study Torah? You know that that somehow you're you're not eligible because of your, you know in discretion in another area of religious life. All right, Pilar. So um, basically my, my thought is, yes, that is how it should be. Yeah, it wouldn't matter if the person is convert or not, but if, if is, are you judging the same someone who is eating hamburgers and come to study Torah? But I've heard it many, many times. Oh, but they're born Jews. But if you're a convert, it, it even worse. more. Because yes. then your Judaism is judged. Yes. And yes. that is um, part and after of what all, is very radical. Yes, even more radical. And after all, somebody who has converted for a certain period of life, they were not under the obligation to eat in this particular way. So eat all the more so. Stephanie. Well, in the first third year of the, you know, the first one, you know, it's hard to see people sometimes that, as one of my students says, I'm, I turned over a new leaf and I'm now a new person. But if you're a convert, like, it really was like a ceremony you went through to, like, become a new person. And it's very difficult to see them like that. And I used to live near D.C. for about 18, for 18 years, and there's a whole big discussion um, called, like, damn the box, that you won't have to accept it and have a criminal record when you apply for um, when you apply for jobs, because it really prevents people yes, from getting jobs. Yes, that was recently, like, yes, like, like, recently banned here in North Carolina. I'm sorry? That was recently banned. You can't do that anymore in North Carolina. Oh, okay. Yeah, so I know that's a big great thing. example. I, I'm yeah. sorry, people I just... People go through their prison time or their probation time or whatever, and they're still, you, you know, like, be so reminded like, yeah. the consequence of this forever. Yes. And so, uh, I don't know, so it's kind yeah. of like this idea that, like, you have to have a hard time seeing people. Letting people person. grow and, yeah. and change. Absolutely. Great. Deborah and then Amy. Well, I, I think the other thing that I find disturbing about this is that there, I think there are macroaggressions, not microaggressions. <laughs> yeah. But it's also saying that nothing that you were before this has any value. And that nothing that you bring to this, your Judaism, before you became Jewish, has any value. And that, that you know, when you say you're a new person, 
but you're not a new person. I mean, you're a new, you are a new person in some ways, but you're not. Yeah. You bring a lifetime of experiences, and more than that, generations of experiences. And when you say something like that to a person, you're saying, none of that matters. None of that, not only does it matter, but it has no worth. The only way that you, the only worth that you have is the worth that you gave since you've become a Jew. And, and I think that's, that's also an incredibly horrible thing to say. And, and, and I mean, if we truly believe that all people are basically Elohim, you were basically Elohim before you were a Jew, right? So I just, and, I, and I've heard people say that. And, and I think it, it just, mm. I, I, yes. Yes. Yeah. No, I love how you lifted that up in even greater relief. Yeah, Amy. I just want to comment. One of the things I love about these texts, um, so this is from the Babylonian Talmud, right? Which is, you know, discussions, I don't know, 200 plus or minus years from the years, mythical year zero and not written yeah. down to like 600, yeah. you know. And my belief is that the reason the rabbis were discussing this is people were behaving this. like yes. this. So, and, and, we, and we still do. I mean, I think human beings by nature can be judgmental, can be nasty, can be unthinking. And one of the things about probably any religious code, but certainly Judaism, is that it's saying to you, no, it's not necessarily natural to be a good person. You have to work at it. You have to be mindful. You know, the whole issue, I always love this when, when they say, well, children have to be taught to hate. No, they don't. If you ever watch a room of two-year-olds fighting over a toy, they have to learn, they have to be taught how to cooperate, right? And so I think that this holds, it's, it's still paramount 2,000 years later that we have to constantly remind ourselves of these issues because our nature as the human species is not to be so nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, true. Yes. Now, I find it a little ironic that probably the people who do these infractions are usually people who are more religious. Mm -hmm. well, At least outwardly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Part of that is. I think you have someone in particular whom I know who has done this, mm -hmm. who sees herself um, as being better than and to what does any of us like to be that? Not someone that any of you know. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Nina. Um, I think this also applies to either one of your friends who's non Jews, like maybe your friends, you're talking to your friend and they. Um, they ask you about how what do you they ask you about culture or whatever mm -hmm. they ask you about anything. And then you shouldn't think to yourself, oh well I'm really I wanna tell you something, but I'm not gonna tell you I really wanna tell you everything because you just you're just not spiritual enough to understand. Mm -hmm. You gotta so it's just this applies to whenever you're talking to anybody, you shouldn't be like, Oh well, I'm not really gonna tell you everything just because I'm you're not gonna understand it. Like you don't get to you don't get to do that. So yeah. just you shouldn't like you know friends be like oh, I'm gonna keep this to myself because I'm worthy. Yeah. Um, and I don't want to embarrass you, Nina, but you said something I will never forget. It was one of the most beautiful things I have heard in the longest time. I was asking if you guys don't know Nina visiting this summer. Um, she's doing a, a special academic research project under. Um, Dr. Lubkin over here, and um, I said, I know you're in the math department, like, I'd love to hear what you're working on, but like, I don't really know a lot of math. Is it something that I could understand? And she said, Of course, you could understand. You know, there's and you said it even more beautifully than that, like, there's nothing that we can't understand if it's explained well enough. And then you went to explain it in an incredibly rudimentary way, and I was like, yeah, I totally get that. Yeah. <laughs> and you start to get into coding, and I was like, ah, I was totally with you. So you you modeled that actually very beautifully. Thank you for that. Um, anything else? All right, let's let's look on to um, number four. If one is experiencing suffering, another should not respond as insensitively as Job friends did. Okay, so you may remember if you've read the book of Job. Um, there are all kinds of examples of Job's friends basically doing a terrible job of uh, comforting him as he met just immense suffering in his life. 
Um, and there are a number of examples, things like, you know, who, who remembers the specific oh, example? You, you obviously weren't uh, observant enough. Yes, otherwise yes. You you, you still, on some level, you must have deserved this because of your um, lack of piety. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That was Jonathan's memory. So just, no, just got, it would get to the level of like where the like commentators even discuss whether like the friends were even like not even friends to begin with. Yeah, right? seriously. That's not how friends treat each other. But yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, number five. If there were if there were donkey drivers asking him for feed, he should not say to them, go to so and so to sell feed, when he knows that person has never sold. That's the deception part. Yeah, yeah. clearly. Yeah. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, I mean, so Mike's saying I don't totally get it. Does somebody want to? Put it into other words. Yeah. Well, I mean, in contrast to some of this, is like other, other, we were talking about exploitation and you know, potentially gain, one person gaining something as a result of it. The others we're talking about putting, you know, sort of micro or macro aggressions. I think it's sort of trying to establish a position of superiority by denigrating somebody else. This one's pretty different in that it's not, there's no benefit. I mean, it's mm -hmm. pretty deep, deep for the donkey. I'm not going to benefit you problem. to send them to somebody who doesn't have it. It's really just being mean. So I mean, it's for like just to, for the sake of doing that. it, it's, it's actually just yeah, like a pain to enjoy by knowing that the person on a little bit. Yeah, yeah, very. I was gonna say, um, there's there's other things too. There there's could be someone hey, you know, that needs help, and you're not, and you're just telling them something to get them out of your face and that's make it not your too, problem. Right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and that's that's something that I read into this one, mm -hmm. um, or or to create. A more desperate situation later. Yeah, mm. it's getting worse and worse the more I think about it. Yes, Mike. Well, I mean, to me, the equivalent, the modern equivalent, would be to tell a parent of a, of a baby that a particular store has formula when they don't have it. <laughs> but why would you? How could anybody do? I mean, I can't imagine anybody doing that. I, I, I mean, I can imagine cheating somebody and, and a whole bunch of other things here, but there's absolutely no reason why. I, I think it, I think an explanation might be um, not that they're well. Yes, this is unkind, but perhaps when they're asked for this question for help and they don't know the answer, rather than taking on that work themselves to try to help find the answer, they just send them on their way. Well, you could just say I don't know the answer. Well, <laughs> they could, they don't, but they don't want to admit they don't know. They don't want to. Figure it out. They, they just time to call customer service and they uh, can't help you, so they pass you on to another department and they can't help you, so they pass you on to another department <laughs> all day. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I had a six That's hour it. experience <laughs> with health insurance last week. That was something wow. like that. Yes. 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 Susan. And also the other party issues. It takes courage and self confidence to be able to say to someone, I'm sorry, I don't know. Mm. Because if I say I don't know, then you might think less, less of me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I don't want you to think less of me because I'm better than you are to begin with. I think you get maybe formula at a place that doesn't even sell those kinds of things because they're going to be out of my way and I can maintain my ill perception of who I am. Then they come back and have something to say to you later. <laughs> Oh, you must have misheard me. <laughs> <laughs> if, if I read the text again, it, it really clearly says that it's not that the person doesn't know and is just telling him, okay, go to that store. But he says when he, he knows, knows that that, that person has never right. sold, he, right. he literally knows. Yeah. Right. Bad. Bad. Yeah, the other question I, I, in my mind is it says that he never sold, not that he doesn't have. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that, that he's sending it to a person who he knows has not in the past been willing to, to give of or share of mm -hmm. what he has. might even have, have it and have it. Well, might not even have it. Some, a totally yeah. different merchant, for instance. Instead of a big merchant, a totally merchant. Harry. What if? The harassed person is the non-merchant you send them to. What if it's 
you get you're sending someone someone who's going to take up their time saying hey will you send will you sell me feed mm -hmm. I, I, I don't sell feed thing. right you know i could be out here selling my um lamb chops that i'm selling but <laughs> you're here distracting me you know right mm -hmm. Go away. yes yes <laughs> it's good all right you're, you're on to it nina read the last one please rabbi yudan says rabbi yudan says he shouldn't even look too much of buying and sort of giving hope to the store, uh, the seller that we're actually interested. And that in and of itself is, it is legal, but it's wrong. It's, it's immoral. Yeah. And it's, it's like going to Barnes and Noble to look at books, like decide what you want, buying it off Amazon where they don't have the overhead mm -hmm. costs. But one different thing is that nowadays, with business cards and websites, if it isn't like an individual craftsperson, you don't have to now, you might look at this stuff and hmm. you want to buy it later. So you take your card and buy it from right. later. So that wasn't an option. Well, I think uh, that, that that a little bit touches on this this number six. Is like on a certain level, some of this is it's not so clear. It's really about kind of what you know on the inside. What are what are your intentions? And your intentions might be okay, you know. There are plenty of things, I don't know, when I've gone, for example, to buy a car, big purchase, like I don't necessarily go and buy it on the spot. There's, there's a research process, you know, that that's not wrong to do, um, but I'm serious about it. And and that's something you can know in your heart. Kathy? In my previous life, I did a lot of customer service. That's and, um, you know, we talked a lot about exploiting people in the buying and selling process, but you can also look at it in a more positive light and say that anytime you're in any kind of a transactional relationship with somebody, it's easy to kind of downplay it and say, oh, well, I'm just buying, you know, I'm just picking up my meds at Walgreens, mm -hmm. right? Here, here's the money done, right? But you can raise up that experience just by saying, hello, how are you today, mm -hmm. right? How are you feeling? You know, and, you know, and if you know that person, like in making the whole transactional experience uh, you know, and I vow. And I vow. Right. Right. A good piece. So this last piece to me fits absolutely into that because it says, okay, maybe you don't have the money to buy that today. It's what Anna was saying. Like maybe you don't have the money to buy it today, but if you're creating a relationship with that seller, that's a relationship that could go into the future. So it's not really, it can also be about the negativity, but it can also be about making even our mundane everyday transactions, raising them up a little bit and so, making it a way to connect with each other. Yeah. Yes, that even these mundane interactions are an opportunity for us to ele elevate and connect to the divine in the other or vice versa. Yes, Deborah. I was just going to say that um, I, I, I think that um, this this is clearly talking about a time when we were, we were dealing with individual craft people who actually made their goods or relied on it for livelihood. I would argue that there's a difference between going to somebody who makes their own things, looking at it, pricing it, and then buying it on Amazon, than Barnes and Noble and Amazon. Because honest to God, Jeff Bezos is not going to have less money for his family if I decide that I want to buy it someplace else. So I do think that there's a difference in in um, in in who you're dealing with and, and the entity that you're dealing with. And also because most, I shouldn't say most, but many salespeople, even in these bigger stores, no longer work on commission. When people work on commission, I think that was a real issue. And I mean, my mother always made a point of saying, I'm only looking, go, you know, do what you need to do, because that person was working on commission. And so she wasn't going to take that person's time when she knew she wasn't going to buy something. But these days, many, many of the people who work in stores, for better or for worse, don't work on commission. And so I think that's also a different issue, because again, you know, I don't know the best buy is going to go out of business because I decided that I want to look there and then I want to buy someplace where it's going to be cheaper. But, um, but if, but if I was working with somebody who actually made that product, then I think I have an obligation. Yes. Oh, lots of hands. 
Okay, <laughs> Terry, Mike, Stephanie, and then we'll go to I would, I would say that there's a, always a difference between legitimate comparative shopping and when you truly in your heart are willing to buy it there, mm -hmm. but you're still making a decision in that. I, I think mm -hmm. that's all I want to say. Yep. Yep. Yeah. yep. Mike. Well, suppose you're in the store and the sales person's not on commission, but you are keeping that person occupied who could be helping somebody. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I mean, I think that's certainly an issue, especially since there's never enough sales people these days. Right. I'm saying in line behind you, wait a minute. But, but, but that's not, but that, but that's not what this is talking about. This is not talking about my inconvenience of another customer. This is talking about my exploiting the person who's exactly. doing the selling, which is, I think, a different I'm throwing it at another person. Yeah, I, I think it's a different issue. Stephanie, were you going to say Yeah, I was going to say that the person's time. I have to say that, like, uh, one of the things I've heard that I like to do is go to open houses. So obviously, I have no intention of buying the house, but we have open houses. Yeah. So we try really hard to make sure that the person knows we're not oh, there for us to then take up their time. Yes. So they always ask, we don't have to take the house, or we can get yes. papers. And we can say, oh, no, thank you, we just want to walk for it yeah. or whatever. Because, you know, even if there's no other people around, they can do another stuff on their own for their work. And right, you know, right, so. right. That's a beautiful practice. Uh, yes, Erin. So I was at home. Okay, um, right. I'm an associate at Kohl's, and we have a woman who comes in about once a month. Mm -hmm. She goes around the entire store and puts everything into her car until she comes to the register. So she puts everything onto the cashier and says, I don't want this anymore. Mm -hmm. And at first, <laughs> we were very judgmental of her because it was a waste of our time. Yeah. And it was a waste of all those items to pass it on and we had to them back yes. at the end of the night. Yes. And sometimes we just dump them in a in like a big pile or something and we have to take it back and things like that. But um then we found out that her husband works twelve hour shifts for most of the day. That she really doesn't have anyone else mm -hmm. around to take care of her. Mm -hmm. So she comes in to um basically have someone to experience because mm -hmm. uh, she's so lonely. Yeah. And so I think that kind of it reminds me of her point about, you know, how customer service, it can really help a person to, and even though she is wasting our time, you know, we're helping her so much. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. Yes. I have a very contemporary example. And when Sassy was talking, it just sort of saw it. It reminds me of the scene in Pretty Woman. When Yes. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> Julia Roberts walks into the store and she's not dressed appropriately for the store. Mm -hmm. And the sales ladies there are judging her and evaluating yes. her. And then when she obviously puts herself together and looks the role yes. and she walks back in, she's reminding them of what they did. And they are speechless. I love what she said. Yes. Wouldn't that be Huge. a violation of number one here? Yeah. <laughs> no, because they were never finished. That's, that's right. You're right. Um, okay. So if we look at these six examples of exploitative or in really insulting speech, the first four statements I would say on this list would would be cruel. They're cruel, but they're not necessarily misleading. They're mean, they're insulting, but they're not necessarily misleading. They're about one person lowering the status of somebody else. Um, but it's not really clear that they're being taken advantage of. So why do you think the rabbis might have included those first four statements in that category of what we're calling ona'a or exploitative or deceptive speech. Because what? status is always a factor in negotiations. Nope. Okay. So we hear Perry says status is always a factor in negotiation. So yes. Great. And I think the other part is that because we are human, th those are the kinds of behaviors that appear to be more prevalent. Mm. Deborah. I see it as the, the um, uh, um, uh, uh, wanting something that, 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 you know, why is that in the Ten Commandments that you shouldn't want something that is essentially yeah. right because it leads to behavior, it leads to action. If you treat people 
people like this, if this is how you look at other human beings, then it leads to uh, bad business practices, it leads to exploiting them, it leads to all those kind of things. You can't treat, you can't do that to people if you don't think of, if you think of that as human beings with dignity. Fantastic, Kathy. Um, yeah, it's about, you know, all of those first four things. It's about meeting people where they are, where, where, where whatever they present to you. It's about meeting people where they are, where we, and, you can, and you can't have a truly even playing field unless everybody comes, it's, you know, it's exactly like status does matter, right? Mm -hmm. All the time, right? So if you come in with those ideas in your head, you have to let them go, because otherwise it's going to be unfair on one way or the other, right? It has to be a level playing field for it to be a truly like just transaction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Pilar. I think it also, um, just piggybacking from them, um, it also makes the fact that when you are looking to this person and making them feel lower than you, they are immediately in a vulnerable place. And you start this saying, I was new buying this and I was vulnerable and they can take advantage of me. Yeah. So that is exactly what they are doing in this four examples. They're putting yeah. the person lower so the person will be vulnerable. Yeah, exactly. Yes, Anna. Can I tell a short story related to number two and three? Of course. Once upon a time, long ago, not here, I was, <laughs> in, my, I was in my own school where I was a member. And we're at another the, synagogue. Another we synagogue. Okay. I was a member there yeah. back in the day. And one of the other regulars had brought a friend who was visiting from out of town. And the custom at this show was everyone wearing in town. Okay. And the guest from out of town, what's my name now? Mishini, what are you doing here? Oh, and if he had not been older, like a lot older than me, yes. I was about ready to say, I'm a member here. You're you not. are not. <laughs> yes. But I did not. But because of that, because I'm spite motivated, <laughs> I think it's that, your shooting. Yes. I yes. embroidered Celtic knot work on my cleat. <laughs> if I were less spite motivated, I might have decided maybe I didn't have a place for this kid in the synagogue. Right? Yes, of course. Of course. Oh, yes. What a yucky, yucky so feeling. I'm so sorry oh, yeah. that happened to you. And sadly, not surprised. It happens all the time in different kinds of ways. I'm sure many people could attest to that. Yes, Larry. That's right. Like Tina Turner said, R E S P C K. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I love Tina, you but know, she said Um, okay, so yes, I want to really just emphasize um, what Pilar said. I think there's a really strong link that's being made here between financial and verbal manifestations of exploitation because the perpetrator ultimately is in possession of a similar mindset. And there can be a similar impact, therefore, um, on the heart of the victim. And Rabbeinu Bakhtia, who's a, a much later uh, rabbi and offers us commentary, he was from Spain um, in the 13th, 14th century. Um, he's going to give another explanation. And with this, we'll, we'll kind of bring it all together. So can I get another reader? Somebody else will read? Steve, go for it. I'm voluntarily you. <laughs> <laughs> a person should not exploit their fellow, and you should fear your God. This verse refers to exploiting in language. A person should not antagonize their fellow or give them inappropriate advice. And our rabbis of blessed memory said, all of the gates of prayer can be closed, except the gates of exploitation. And the reason why these gates stay open is that the exploited person is exceedingly upset and is distressed. Mm -hmm. And his heart literally is, they're in like psychological pain. And mm -hmm. his heart is subsumed by his sorrow, and he prays out his worry with intention, and he is heard. And if the exploiter says to himself, Who will know that I intended harm? Therefore it says, and you shall fear your God. All right. And this is really to Larry's point. You know, why say at the end of this, I am the Lord your God? You know, there's plausible deniability for a lot of these uh, transgressions. And um, the perpetrator could, might think that either their act could go unnoticed 
or maybe even that it was kind of missed on the other person. I, and this is actually the part that even strikes me as the worst, worst part about it. Like if somebody and a couple of you have mentioned, like when you come into a space and you experience yourself as being vulnerable for any number of reasons. Like I know when somebody has done something transgressive to me and I've been in it, felt myself to be a little bit on the outside or more vulnerable, like I sometimes think to myself that I did something wrong, right? Like, oh, did I miss what I was supposed to be doing here, it didn't, you know? So what makes it even more painful, I think, is this idea that the perpetrator might actually lead the victim to take it upon themselves to have, feel a sense of responsibility for something that was inflicted upon them. Ellen. This is, that is actually a really valid point because if you ever look at abusive relationships, mm -hmm. The, the person who is abused frequently says, it's my fault, yes. I did something wrong. Yes. And the abuser uses that. Yes. And that's why they can't get out of the relationship yes. because they're convinced yes. that it's all their fault. Yes, absolutely. Yes, definitely. Well, I was just going to say, I mean, I, I, I absolutely agree, Ellen, that that's true on a, a personal level. It's also true on a social level. I mean, we, we talk about the deserving poor. Like there are poor, that which implies that there are poor people who brought it on themselves with their own fault, and so they are not deserving of any kind of social support. Um, social Darwinism is still alive and well in, in I've never even heard that phrase. I'm yeah. sorry, what? Deserving poor. The deserving poor. Oh, by the way, he's talking about it all the time. The working and, and poor. Exactly the, you know. um, and it's a very, it's a, it's, it's, it's a relatively common thing that people talk about when they're talking about um, food stamps and mm -hmm. and um, housing assistance and Medicaid and you know all those kinds of social support systems that we've created in our society because we believe or there are some of us who believe or we believed at one time that part of the, the job of government was to, to level the playing field so to speak but the implication of that always is that there are undeserving for we see it in like somebody says they have cancer. You heard that somebody got a cancer diagnosis. Were they smokers? Mm. Were they overweight? Mm -hmm. Did they exercise? How did they eat? What you know, there's always that that implication that that we did or somebody did something wrong, and therefore they deserve this kind of treatment. So I think it's the same thing. I think it's it's just writ large. Yeah, there's a judgment in a society. You know, that was another one of Job's friends. Uh, you know. Right, right. I was just going to say to Deborah's point, we make these judgments on who is deserving or not. I just heard the story on NPR last month. They um, were taking a woman from Central America who was in a refugee camp, and they took her when she was talking about they don't have enough supplies and people sleep on the floor and cardboard. They brought her to one of the refugee camps where they're bringing in Ukrainian refugees and that place is overflowing with donations you know baby strollers and and these are people who are really in the camp for 24 hours for some of these ukrainians are being resettled and the, this woman i don't remember which country she's from but you know she, she was so hurt and so angry they have all these supplies to be here for a day and we have been in this camp for weeks mm -hmm. But what America has decided will shower the Ukrainians with their light skin. So I also just want to draw out from what um, Bakhtia, uh, Rabbeinu Bakhtia says here, that these laws of exploitation also invite us to focus on the outcome for the victim rather than the intent of the perpetrator. They invite us to consider how this is going to land for somebody else. Um, and that just because um, you don't have malintent, let's just say, let's just say, but it, it could land for somebody in a way that's like deeply harmful to their sense of self or deeply deceptive in terms of what they then go and do. 
Like that's what that's what matters. Um, yes, Susan. So one of the things that I learned and teach is that people don't judge us. We're not judged on our intentions because mm -hmm. people don't know our intentions. They can't read our intentions. Yeah. We're we are judged and examined based on our behaviors. Yeah. So even if the behavior, even if the behavior is it wasn't my intention to hurt you, all I know is that I was hurt, mm -hmm. or that you were mean, or yes. that you were unkind. Yes. Um, and uh, is Eric on Zoom, Amy? Uh, he is on Zoom. Okay. So Eric will remember this. This is one of like our earliest um, marital arguments, <laughs> and I have heard him in some way. I cannot remember how, but I was. It was just unbearable to me. That I had intentional that that I had hurt him at all, and the big argument that ensued from that is, but I didn't mean it. I didn't, you know, there was no part of this that I intended. For, I understand that that happened, but I didn't mean for that to happen. And I'll never forget. As now it's twenty five years later, and I'm still uh, recounting the story. He's like, I don't care about your intention. I need you to know that what you did hurt me. And that's what matters. And I was like, no, 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 but the intention <laughs> <not> <laughs> matters. It doesn't, it doesn't. When it comes to inflicting harm on someone else, it doesn't matter. I mean, it does on some level, but but what matters more is is just the intent. Because yeah, Emma could not see, could not see whether you intended or not. That's true, and even well, when I explained it, it <laughs> 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 even when he said he couldn't be able to see, it still hurt. It still yeah. hurt. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. And it gets even more twisted because you have to consider the the psychological place where the other person is. Now, Susan says we are judged on our our okay. behaviors. I learned that as a child and I wish it were so because I thought that meant that if I did everything right, then everything would be good for me and people would be nice to me all the time. Or, no, we're judged based on how the other person is feeling at the moment. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, and they, they treat other people around them. Mm -hmm. And this relates to what they were saying as well. We asked, well, were they smokers? Did they eat right? Whatever. Because we're afraid. And we don't want the bad thing to happen to us. And we think, oh, if only I do everything right, then nothing bad will happen to me. Well, we want to believe that. Want to find out the other person if it's someone sent me for favor. Right, right. Yeah. And virtue. Amy. I just wanted to comment. I mean, that's part of the formula um, during the 10 days of Chuba, right? That between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, the line is sometimes it's in Hebrew or Yiddish, I don't know the languages and cards, you don't know what they're saying, but it says, uh, if I have harmed you either intentionally or unintentionally, please forgive me. And working with students, well, how can you hurt somebody unintentionally? And we would come up and develop examples. And so it's not, the, the issue is for the hurt party, the issue is not the intent, the issue is they were hurt. And for the person who caused that, even if unintentionally, to acknowledge the fact that some other actions cause harm. Well, yeah. Do we remember correctly that the sacrifices, the blood sacrifices yeah. in the temple were only covering unintentional sins? Yes, yeah. so there, there are whole categories of laws that are the shogay, that are accidental or the mazid on purpose. And there are different consequences for these different categories of transgression. That's how I would that's how we describe it generally, but you have a specific example. Well, I was thinking specifically of that because I was reading um about follow the second temple and mm -hmm. the transformation from uh temple worship to rabbinical. Um and um and uh prophets mean short starts with an age. Yeah. yeah. Um and <laughs> was talking <laughs> was okay. talking about um, how the verse there talking about, I think it was actually in reference to Babylonian exile, but how the, to um, how that was being replaced with prayer, mm -hmm. and that's kind of making me think this: we can, for our unintentional, all of this is unintentional when we, you know, accidentally 
say something that hurts someone. Mm -hmm. We can deal with the lack of intent by penance to God. We have to deal with the consequences of our actions by fixing those who we've hurt. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, some of what this is saying is you should be paying more attention, right? I mean, we we do often accidentally hurt people, people we know, people we care about, strangers, etc. Um, but I, I think that part of what this text is saying to us is, yeah, you should be paying more attention to what you're doing because because maybe you are doing this unintentionally, but that's that's not a pass. And and if you were more careful about what you said and how you behaved. You wouldn't be doing that, and and you know I think that um, uh, we often say that. Well, I, as you said, I didn't mean to do that. So what? If you were paying more attention, you wouldn't have done it. And I think that's an important part of this. Mm -hmm. Amy, Jonathan, and then we'll get two back. One, just I want to let you know that Eric did chime in that he remembers the story. <laughs> 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 I'm sure he does. Oh, yeah. 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 No, the, the response on your part should be, I'm sorry that I hurt you. I didn't intend it, yes. but you were hurt. Yes. And when you say, if I hurt you, you're yes. you're taking away the validity yes. of their feelings. Yes. And you have to take ownership for the fact that even your unintentional actions can hurt people. Yes, 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 yes. Jonathan. One thing is common. You really remind me of way too many arguments my mother brought up. Jonathan is feeling triggered. <laughs> I, I was thinking, yes, the text well, uh, inc would, uh, it encourages us not to like shy away and do better about those lapses of attention, but also there is something deeply ingrained in our tradition to understand that those lapses attention will happen no matter what. It, it said that as much as you may, you know, start the year off right, you will uh, end up uh, at some point being uh, walking blind. Yeah. yeah. Words are so powerful. So what I thank you for such a rich conversation. Um, my my hope and uh, intention was that that this particular conversation would remind us not only to be um, have an increased heightened awareness of how we use words, but also to to inspire us to to raise our level of sensitivity in considering how they land for other people. So not only what words we choose and making sure that they come from the right place inside of us, um, but also to remember, like this is going to um, this is going to land for somebody else, and to be sure that we're we're really mindful of of how we're positioning ourselves in that interaction. Um, and there's a great acronym that I was taught by one of my meditation teachers, um, Rabbi Sheila Pelt Weinberg. And uh, it's one of my favorites. And the acronym is WAIT, which stands for Why Am I Talking? <laughs> <laughs> and so it's a wonderful reminder, um, sometimes just to even slow down and to consider, to help us consider how, how our words will land, how we're considering the power dynamics in a relationship, how those words might be, God forbid, um, used in an exploitive or deceptive way. Um, and the last one that I'll just add in addition to weight is uh, very early on when they Rob and Adi were little and I was getting some parenting help at Project Enlightenment. Does that still exist? I hope yeah, it does. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, they were a wonderful help to me and I still remember this the parent counselor who I was meeting with said, I was trying to think, it, the, the question was around like, do I say this or do I not say this? And she offered me as a way to have as an internal compass, helpful or hurtful. Helpful or hurtful. And we still use this in our family now all the time. 
you know, as a way. Then when I think about, should I say this? Helpful or hurtful? And that seems to be a pretty, pretty good topic. Yeah. I heard recently in the workshop, boy or joy. <laughs> right. Right. Boy right. or joy. All right, friends. So um, feel free to take your text with you or on your way out, you can plunk them down the table. We're going to dive in Mari. So I invite everybody to grab a seat door. <laughs> I was looking over, but you, you were busy. Remember, we had dinner together in Durham. Ah, oh, 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 it's a restaurant. Right, right, right. right, 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 right. Yes, 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 yes. Who else was there? Yeah. Bobby is yes. a guest from Israel. Yes, 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 yes. yes, yes. How are you guys doing? Yeah. Are you coming here with us? Yeah, I'm. I'm, I'm, I'm yeah, I'm often, here. Often, often where, where do you live? In uh, South Raleigh, actually. So it's oh, you live in Raleigh? Oh, okay. I thought you were from Durham or something. No, no, no. no. I live towards Gary. South. What is that? Southwest? Are you living close? Uh, no, we live in close. Um, there's a lot of kind of just jumping around. I don't know why that is in Left Shalem, but just get ready. <laughs> I'll give you the page numbers, but we're going to begin tonight on 39. B. 39B. <laughs> As we prepare to begin with Harafu, just going to invite everyone um, to take a moment to breathe, take a deep breath. There's a tradition that on Shavuot, this holiday in which we commemorate receiving Torah, that there's kind of like, like a download of the new system of the Torah that we've been working on, that we've been internally coding, the wisdom, the instruction that we've been cutting our teeth on, that on Shavuot is the moment when we sort of upgrade our, let me see me doing computer talk, upgrade <laughs> our operating system. Um, with the Torah that we've been we've been cultivating. So as we dive in tonight, as we pray, it's of course in gratitude for the gift of Torah, our lives, this moment. Also opening ourselves up, creating channels of receptivity so that we can fully, fully bring in and integrate the Torah that we've been working towards in our own lives. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not a 
that you feel inspired to work on in the days ahead. This is a beautiful moment to really meditate on that particular piece of poem. But the traditional prayers are found on page 306, and you can receive them in your own day. Shalom, 
everyone. Thank you so much. Kathy was an amazing help tonight in many ways, always, but especially with tech support. Thank you for saving the day. Amy, thank you again for making it possible for us to share our experience with those um, who are not physically here, but who this presence may feel. And thank you all for being here late into the night. Um, we also have some bakers to thank. Oh, Larry is here. Great. Sean is still here. Anybody else bakers who are here? Bonnie. Yes, Deborah. Oh, thank you so much, Deborah. And Bonnie Baker. And Amy. Bonnie and Amy. And Amy. Oh, my gosh. Yay. Thank you all, <laughs> wonderful bakers. Um, and thank you, Stuart, for helping us enjoy these delicious treats. All right. So tomorrow morning, Minion at 930 in the sanctuary. Uh, we are going to um, uh, celebrate the, the daytime of Shavuot with beautiful Torah reading and some more Torah study as well. Rabbi Eric um, prepared a beautiful text and teaching, so I'm excited to engage in that with all of you. And then again, on Monday, we'll have the second day of Shavuot, morning davening, 9.30, with the addition of Yisra prayers, and we're going to have a beautiful dish addition of um, our preschool students have created a flower parade. They're going to come bring in their flower creations uh, in the spirit of this spring festival. So that is something else to look forward to. Any other announcements? Okay, so what happens from here? You have choices. As um, I mentioned at the beginning, again, if you'd like to stay here, Deborah is going to be holding space for ongoing Torah study until everybody gets too tired. Um, folks who are on Zoom can continue on. Uh, with Deborah here, and then if you'd like to head home, just remember that you have access and you can look on the Beth Meyer website, go to the calendar for the teaspoon to get the link if you don't have it readily available so you can continue on studying um, with our whole movement across the country as we move further on into the night of Shavuot. Thank you all for your attention. Uh, late into the evening, and just wishing everyone a beautiful rest of the holiday. <laughs>